Back it up. Go to six, two. Not much has changed in the sleepy little town of Bonifay. Nestled off Interstate 10 in Florida's Panhandle, this rural country is known more for its slow southern style than for murder. They kill people by various means, for unknown or no reason. It was a long time ago, more than two decades, but there are folks here that still remember the moment when an ill wind blew through town. I remember that she was killed at home, and later on, they said that uh, probably a man got off the train and went out there and done it. Gerilyn Peoples, just 18, was coming home from the grocery store. And they heard her drive up. Inside, her killers waited. The girl couldn't defend herself. She was two hands full of groceries, walked in, and they were caught in the house, commenced to shoot her. But they didn't want to get caught. A month later, Brenda Burton, a wife and mother, was found stabbed to death in her bathroom. The next month, a few miles away in Chipley, Ruby McCary was shot through her screen door. Three murders in three months. It was as if a wave of evil washed over this town, then, just as quickly, went away. Just down the road on Interstate 10, newly elected Sheriff John McDaniel got a call from his officers to respond to a robbery in progress. We had an armed robbery. We think we've got one trapped in the building. We may have one down. We're not sure what we've got. The robbery was at a gas station just outside of Mariana. It was early in the morning, December 15th, 1980. I arrive at the scene, and I get out, and as I'm starting to approach the little store one of the officers comes toward me and, and the look on his face was just unbelievable and he said we've got one down so I kept moving forward and as I did I began to see the opening of the door and I saw a man's feet and then I saw some trousers and then I saw a man with a goatee and it was my father he had been beaten with a tire iron and shot Sheriff McDaniel's father died hours later. 250 miles east on I-10, the Jacksonville Police Department had its hands full. Eight unsolved murders over three years, including Deborah O'Quinn. This was a case of an 18-year-old young lady that was sexually battered and stabbed to death in her apartment over in the south side of town. Her body wasn't initially recovered. It was recovered almost a year later at a dump site, and she was... Uh, actually skeletal at the time, so a lot of your potential physical evidence associated with the body was gone. A trail of crime from one end of Florida to the next, seemingly unrelated, all unsolved, destined for the cold case file. The eight murders in Jacksonville, the women in Bonifay, the sheriff's father. You want to solve every case, especially one that uh, involved one of your family members. Not once in nearly a decade did police suspect they might have a serial killer in their midst. Not once could they have imagined two killers working together, roaming the countryside from coast to coast. The idea was beyond belief. But in my experience dealing with serials, working them, interviewing them, they tend to stay in a certain methodology with slight changes because it's a learning process along the way. They get a little bit better at it. They get a little more comfortable with it. This is different. This is bizarre. Could we have another possibility? They killed at random. No evidence, no motive. In Oklahoma, a woman was stabbed 42 times. A woman strangled, then raped in Louisiana. A little girl abducted at gunpoint in Illinois. But the most explosive and most publicized case centered around the kidnapping, torture, and beheading of a wide-eyed, freckle-faced little boy named Adam Walsh. I always say if you could order the son out of a catalog, that would be the little boy you would order. And I loved him more than anything in the world. John Walsh and his wife, Reve, have replayed that day over and over. One moment, Adam is playing video games at a Sears store. The next minute, he's gone vanished. There were shoppers all around, even a security guard. It was the middle of the day, yet no one really saw much of anything. Unfortunately, none of them panned out, and 
we really don't think we have a good, solid witness that saw what happened to Adam. The sun went down, the store closed, and Adam was nowhere to be found. Revae put signs all over the car. Adam, we're still looking for you. Adam, please stay here, anything. And, uh, you know, when nightfall came, it was unbearable because now it wasn't light out anymore. And um, that's when the harsh reality comes in that you're, uh, things are, are not going the right way. It's unbearable. A massive search was launched. Helicopters looked from above, while friends of the Walshes, even strangers, walked through fields, combed the area, hoping for a sign or a clue. But none came. We'd appreciate anyone with any information about him or have seen him or think they saw him to please call the Hollywood police. Where was Adam? It would be a while before this man would say he knew where Adam was, and the others too. Was it possible? Could one man be the common thread between all these murders? Locked in a prison cell for burning down two buildings, a two-bit arsonist in Florida, a man named Otis Toole, began confessing to murder. Confessing to killing the women in Bonifay, the sheriff's father, even the brutal slaying of six-year-old Adam Walsh. Was he really capable of such heinous acts? According to local lore in Jacksonville, Florida, Tool's hometown, as a young boy, he could be found wandering among the tombstones, digging for bones, doing the devil's work. After his mother died, a 34-year-old Tool would sometimes sleep on her grave. I really uh, got into that, uh, got into devil worship all the way. When he's asked about his crimes, he moves as in a trance and then gleefully confesses to murder. Some of them's been cut wide open, and some of them's been with a head, arms, and legs, and, and all that uh, cut up. Detectives searched his face, looking for a sign of the rottenness inside, looked into his eyes, and swore they saw Satan himself. I mean, the, his background is such that if you saw this man walking down the street, you're probably going to pick up the phone and dial 911. Otis Toole was born March 5, 1947, in Jacksonville, Florida. He was raised in a neighborhood of boarded up houses and little opportunity. Otis was the youngest of five kids. According to prison records, his alcoholic father deserted them, and his mother admitted she couldn't handle him. He had no education. He couldn't hardly read. I mean, and he was just kind of limited to what he could do. He had an IQ of 75, barely able to read and write. He ran away from home when he was nine. By 13, Tool was busted for breaking and entering. He was in and out of boys' schools. He survived on the street by selling himself, and he could be found dressed in female attire. Antisocial personality, some sexual deviance, uh, illiterate, transient kind of lifestyle. Uh, he was homosexual and would just float around from relationship to relationship. He had no morals. Tool had no morals. It was obvious. Tool was trouble with a capital T, and trouble seems to always find trouble. So it was no real surprise when he hooked up with a convicted murderer, Henry Lee Lucas. They met at a soup kitchen in Jacksonville, soon became lovers, and moved in together at Toole's mother's house. Lucas had killed his own mother when he was 23. They had nothing to do but travel around and roam around. Apparently they had no gainfully employed, and they just went around stealing and moving on, trying to stay ahead of the game. And what a deadly game they played until their capture in 1983. Lucas was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison in Texas for the murder of nine people. Toole was picked up for arson in Florida. Now they played with police, sending them down a dozen different pathways, drawing pictures of their victims, and boasting about their murders. Well, I've killed by strangulation, I've killed by knifing, I've killed by hit and runs, shootings, robberies, uh, hangings, uh, Every, every type of crime, I've done it. 
it became a gruesome game of one-upmanship. Some of them would be shot in the head, and back of the head, and behind the ear, and uh, in the chest. And... It's just like going out and butchering a hog, really. Uh, there's no difference. Lucas bragged to police that he killed more than 600 men, women, and children. Tool claimed 125 victims. Some of them would be uh, choked to death, and some of them would be uh, beat it in the head with a tire tool. Or... It was all horror beyond belief. The tale they spun was incredible, but their confessions raised more questions than answers. My father was laying in the floor right inside this door. Eight years after his father was shot and beaten to death at this Florida gas station, Sheriff John McDaniel was no closer to solving the mystery. Yeah, it brings back memories. Then, a break. A call came in from a Florida law enforcement officer. He said, John, uh, was your father killed in a service station, like a convenience store? Yes. And displaced area, a four-lane highway, the different things he was asking. I don't remember what all the questions were. And I said, yes. He said, I may have some. I'll get back with you. Sitting in separate prison cells, first Lucas, then Toole, confessed to police that they murdered Sheriff McDaniel's father. I started uh, hitting with a tire tool all in the head. And, uh, and, uh, Henry uh, had a 25 wood mat. He pulled that gun out and uh, shot him in the head. What did y'all do then? Well, Henry got his wallet and uh, throwed his wallet down. And, uh... In a tape-recorded conversation, Toole accurately described the crime scene, providing police with the kind of information only the killer would know. And then Toole said something else. And then all of a sudden, Toole, he closed his eyes and he looks back and he says, there wasn't a hand on that left arm. Well, that was never publicized. My father's left hand had been taken off surgically after a gunshot wound in that hand in the 40s. Imagine meeting your father's killer face to face. Sheriff John McDaniel went to Lucas's Texas jail cell, looked him straight in the eye, and asked, did you kill my father? He sat there for a little bit, and he'd look away, and he'd think about it for a minute. He says, that's when he says, oh, I was there when your daddy was killed. But I didn't kill him. I was on the telephone. The hands of death killed your father. The two men claimed a sadistic cult, the hands of death, hired them to kill, sacrificing their victims and eating their flesh. The stories were outrageous, yet they knew so much, had so many details. The father's missing hand, the murder weapon. He was for real. It was for real. It was not. Uh... He couldn't have been making this up. Toole and Lucas were indicted and charged with the murder of Sheriff McDaniel's father. But not all of their confessions would be so convincing to police. In Jacksonville, there were eight unsolved cases, and the deadly duel of Lucas and Toole wanted the credit. Law enforcement believed that if you're going to confess, you must be guilty. Why would you confess? And we just didn't understand how these individuals work. We didn't understand the personality profile of a, of a person that could, that could do that. Could Otis Toole have killed hundreds of people? And what about Adam Walsh? Was this self-professed serial killer the face behind Florida's most famous murder mystery? Lots of memories about him, how kind he was to everybody. He was the light of everybody's life, and uh, he certainly was of mine. I waited my whole life to have that little boy. Memories are all John Walsh has left because on July 27, 1981, six-year-old Adam was kidnapped from a mall in Hollywood, Florida. We're the parents of, of Adam Walsh, who's been missing since yesterday noon from the Hollywood Sears Mall on Hollywood Boulevard. Six and a half years ago. Reve Walsh, his mother, left Adam here right at a new video game display while she went a few aisles away to check out a lamp that was on sale. She left him for just a moment. And in that heart-stopping moment, Adam was gone. John Walsh could never forget that panicked call from his wife. I went back. He wasn't there, John. 
No one would help me. They told me to go to customer service and page him. I went. They wouldn't help me. I'm furious. I'm crying. I've called the police, and no one has come for 20 minutes. Not a cop has shown up here. I said, I'll be there in two minutes. Adam vanished without a trace. Had he simply wandered off, or was it something more sinister? When the sun came up, the Walshes were back at the mall again. They asked if they heard, if I had heard anything yet. And I had the, the picture up in my visor. I pulled it down. I said, we're looking for him, and we'll find him. With each passing day, a paralyzing fear took hold. I am prepared to offer a substantial reward for any information leading to the safe uh, uh, giving up of Adam. And to any of the people out there that might be holding Adam, we are prepared to negotiate ourselves with them for a safe release of Adam. Police were baffled. How could a little boy disappear from a crowded store in the middle of the day? The parking lot full of shoppers. The police station just across the street. Who could pull off such a crime and not leave a single clue behind? Then, two weeks later, a grisly discovery. The worst that we, we could have imagined happened. Adam's head was found in a canal about 125 miles north of the mall. We think we gave it our best, our best effort to bring him back. I just wish it had a happier ending. Adam evidently was too good for this world. He was much greater than this world. What kind of a monster could commit such a wicked act? The Hollywood Police Department began to search for suspects, beginning with the list of known sexual predators, and then moved closer to people who might have known Adam. A lot of murders are, are, are perpetrated by people that have uh, association with the victim of some sort, whether it be family or close friend. So it's obvious that uh, anyone close to Adam was a person of interest, so to speak, and that included the parents, John and Rebecca. Rumors ran rampant. The Walshes were brought in for questioning, given a lie detector test, and then cleared. Adam Walsh's killer was still free, roaming the streets. This person is fully capable of doing it again. John Walsh had no idea how prophetic those words would be. Two years later, a two-bit arsonist behind bars for burning down a couple of buildings in Jacksonville, Florida, would drop a bombshell. He claimed he wanted to come clean about the murder of a little boy. He made admissions that he had killed a young boy from the Fort Lauderdale area and, and uh, killed him and took him and dumped his body. Very, con very um, similar to what we believed happened with Adam. What he recounted the things he said he did were enough to make even the most hardened cop's blood run cold. In his words, Adam was, just came willingly with him to a certain point to where he decided that, that he was safe to grab him without anyone seeing him and threw him in his car. He said that July afternoon, he locked Adam inside his 1971 Cadillac and drove off towards his home in Jacksonville. Along the way, Adam started crying, so he punched him in the face. At some point, he pulled off the road, used a machete, and decapitated Adam. He said he drove around with Adam's head and eventually tossed it into a canal. Adam's head was found at mile marker 130. His body was never recovered. This little boy had no chance when faced with so deranged a killer as Addis Tool. If he met anybody on the street, they'd be scared of him. He was a weird-looking individual. The way he carried himself, the way he looked, the way he communicated. Toole wrote letters to the media and Disney World, boasting about his evil acts. The words are chilling. I'm the man who kidnapped, raped, murdered, and cut up Adam Walsh. I really love to rape and kill, and I'm awfully good at it. Maybe the best in the business. He even wrote Adam's father. I read the letter and threw up in the bathroom when I was showed that letter. I mean, here's a guy that admitted to me in a letter that he had murdered my son. I have the letter. 
what he did to him, and he wanted to $5,000. Was it an evil boast? How many had Tool and his partner actually killed? How could the police be sure? I absolutely believe in evil. I absolutely, I've, I've met it firsthand. I've experienced it firsthand. I believe that good and evil walks this planet. Sitting in their prison cells, Otis Tool in Florida and his soulmate Henry Lee Lucas in Texas were willingly filling in the blanks to hundreds of unsolved murder mysteries across the country. Well, some of them, uh, Henry would cut his throat, you know, and uh, some of them I'd done the same way. And... A two-man nationwide crime wave that left behind a trail of fear first thing that's going to happen is you're going to have every law enforcement agency in the region wanting to interview these guys to clear their own cases, which is exactly what happened. A number of things were successfully solved as a result of talking with those guys. You know, a lot of law enforcement officers benefited from, from talking with those people. And some families benefited too, at least had the satisfaction of knowing the men who killed their loved ones were behind bars. 210 victims in 26 states. Case closed, or so they hoped. It was an odd way to solve a case. Police had the killers. Now, they had to match them to the crimes. We've done cases from the, from the crime scene out, but not, not backwards like that. That was, a, it was an interesting, unique experience. It wasn't easy. Most of the confessions were Jane Doe's, unidentified bodies. But remember that murder in Bonifay, Geraldine Peoples? She was carrying groceries into her home. Tool said he and Lucas were waiting inside. Adding even more detail, Tool told police his teenage niece Becky and his young nephew Frank were waiting outside. Tool and Lucas sent them outside of the house to hide, you know, before the girl come home. According to police, Becky left behind a pair of gloves and Frank remembered seeing a set of drums off in another room, adding support to the killer's confession. But why would they bring children along? Tool took the responsibility to be their guardian, so to speak, and actually, and it was a good cover for them. They referred to that several times. Nobody would think anything about it with those children with them. Tool and Lucas reportedly traveled with the kids as far west as California, then north and east to Maryland. They carried a cache of weapons with them, 22s, 38s, knives, a tire iron, and a rope. They camped in the woods and stayed in missions when they could, always looking for handouts. When they needed more, detectives said they would rob and kill, sometimes for food, sometimes just for kicks. They traveled around in junk cars, abandoning them on the side of the road when they broke down. Then they'd ride the rails back to their home in Jacksonville, Florida. From their prison cells, Lucas and Tool took police down their bloody trail. The cops didn't know what they had on their hands. I heard some of the details regarding the homicides that made Charles Manson sound like Tom Sawyer. Why were they talking? Was it an attack of conscience or something more cynical? Police flew Lucas across the country and took Tool on local field trips to the scenes of their alleged crimes. For men who saw only prison walls, they were living a high life. He liked to feed him good, and he would point out a Kentucky Fried Chicken place. <laughs> he, would, he liked chicken because he never got any in prison. The cops, the killers, and the media got caught up in a feeding frenzy. Everyone wanted more, and Tool was eager to oblige by bumping up his murder count. Well, I've done, uh, I've done quite a bit by myself. How many did you do by yourself? Mm -hmm. I'd say about 125. Now what is he? He is now the center of national attention, regional attention, and he feels good about it. I mean, he's now gained something that he's never gained in his entire life, and that's validation and recognition and praise for doing the right thing. 
the two no-account drifters basked in the glow of celebrity. They wanted to be together. They were lovers. They believed that if they could get put in jail together, they could live as homosexual lovers in jail, have all of this sensationalism and, and, and notoriety, and essentially be the king of the hill in prison for the rest of their lives. That was a motivator. Maybe we can come up with Lucas and Tool as being a suspect in your particular area. In 1984, police officers formed a task force to examine the killer's confessions, looking for answers to hundreds of unsolved cases. There was little, if any, physical evidence to link Tool and Lucas to the crime scenes. It was the 80s, and there were no DNA matches. The confession was the key to most cases. The confession was considered to be the best and highest piece of evidence that you could actually have on a person at the time. So, and it was fairly common for law enforcement everywhere in the country. The confession was the bread and butter of the case. Yet some of the stories didn't add up. The killers seemed uncertain about key facts of their crimes. Still, Tool and Lucas kept talking to anyone willing to listen. Each confession was more sensational than the last, more unbelievable. The only way to find out the truth was to uncover physical evidence, something the police had largely neglected to do. Confessions led this case, these particular cases where I think that that hurt by not pursuing all of the leads and physical evidence and, and other evidence at the time. Yet there was some solid evidence left in the very neighborhood where the murderous pair had lived. Not a bloody weapon, but a paper trail. A payroll record, canceled checks, that would prove if Tool and Lucas were telling the truth. The answer would come back to haunt investigators in the Adam Walsh case. Otis Tool told police he loved to burn buildings. He's an arsonist, we know that. Getting caught for burning down two boarding houses sent Tool to prison for 15 years. But it was a confession by his partner in crime, Henry Lee Lucas, that sent Tool to death row. Lucas telling, sort of implicating Tool as setting this fire intentionally, kind of piqued the detectives to reopen that particular case. Lucas claimed an elderly man who had died in the fire was someone Toole knew, and the arson was premeditated murder. When arson investigators went back and looked, a liquid accelerant was found. Here you have a case where you have a crime that he's been convicted before for. It fits his profile. You have something a little bit more compelling. Now, does that mean that he did that? Not necessarily. By today's standard, that still is not enough. But in 1984, it was more than enough. Whether Lucas's confession was true or not, Toole was convicted and sentenced to die. Then, in the ultimate betrayal, Toole's lover, Lucas, murdered Toole's favorite niece in a fit of rage. Toole vowed revenge. I kill her myself, I want. Because? Yeah. Why? Because he killed, uh, he killed my own flesh and blood, and I know how it feels now, you know. It really, it really hurts. Oddly, even after Lucas turned on Tool, they continued to back each other up on even more sensational stories. In a tape-recorded phone conversation, they went so far as to claim cannibalism. And you know what? I used to wipe from their bodies and I did too. Yeah, I know. That cut up like meat, you know. Well, I've seen bodies cut up worse than you've ever seen a body cut up. Tastes like real meat when it's got barbecue sauce on it, don't it? Well... <laughs> the gruesome claims, the sheer volume of confessions made for stunning headlines, but the outrageousness of the claims left some with doubts. Finally, an investigative reporter for the Dallas Times-Herald did what many police did not. He followed a paper trail that showed many of the claims of murder were lies. 
he documented that Toole and Lucas were in Delaware and Maryland at the very time they were supposed to have killed three women in Oklahoma and Colorado. And although police credited the duo with four murders on the West Coast, while sales receipts and employment records placed them on the East Coast in Florida. And on and on, Toole and Lucas's credibility became severely damaged. Now, closed cases were quietly reopened. We were concerned if it was true, because we had cautious flags up that they were, you know, would brag about something that might not have occurred. They may have read it in the paper, or somebody may have come along in an interview and told them about it. And then there were those eight unsolved murders in Jacksonville. A spate of killings laid at the feet of those two. We did work a number of years ago and clearly determined that it was not Otis Tool or Henry Lucas. And what about the Adam Walsh case, Florida's most famous unsolved murder mystery? I'll always be the father of murder child. I'll always be heartbroken. I'll always be angry. Even before the damning evidence that Tool had lied on other cases, there were problems with Tool's confession to Adam's murder. It was an odd coincidence that he confessed just one day after a movie about Adam's killing aired on television. Tool had access to a TV in prison. Was it possible that he picked up details from the movie to make police think he was guilty? The movie showed the kidnapping took place at a Sears store. Adam was inside at the toy department. These same details were in Toole's confession. Toole also claimed Henry Lee Lucas was with him when he snatched Adam from the mall. But that was impossible. Lucas was in jail on an old auto theft warrant. Now he changed his story. And then he then went on to admit that he alone committed the crime. And he alone killed the child. And he alone disposed of the remains. And there were several versions of how he disposed of the remains as well. The case was made even more difficult by Toole's actions. He'd confess, then recant. He confessed several times, and recanted several times, and then confessed to it again, and then recanted again. That's a problem, especially since you can't place that person being out as tool with physical evidence you can't place him anywhere uh, involved anywhere in this crime not as tool told other prisoners in the prison because I talked to him they said he loved to play with the cops he loved to play with them he'd give them enough information to make them serious and then he'd recant it and watch him scramble around like idiots was it a game to find out, police tried to trick him by driving him around and showing him different sites where Adam might have been kidnapped. Tool passed the test. He was taken to other Sears malls, and not just the one here in Hollywood, to see if he could was, would identify the one that he said that he conducted, where he did this crime. And he did, according to what I read, correctly point out the Hollywood Mall, right across the street from the police station. Detectives said he did have access to a weapon, a machete or bayonet, and it was the type of weapon that was used to kill Adam. There were similarities in the instrument that we believe were used, how many times he needed to strike the body to do what eventually happened with the body. And the medical examiner said Adam had been punched in the face. In Toole's confession, he mentioned hitting a little boy. There was similar trauma to the remains were he indicated that he had struck the child. Detectives tracked down the car tools said he used to kidnap Adam. The vehicle was recovered and it was impounded. It was tested. It was uh, evidence was attempted to be recovered from the vehicle. And it was, in fact, blood, bloody carpet that was, in fact, recovered from the back of the back seat of the vehicle. But back in the 1980s, there was no DNA testing, and they couldn't prove it was Adam's blood in Tool's car. Without the murder weapon, an eyewitness, and with Tool's recanting his confession, the police didn't believe they had enough to charge him with murder. But really, really, to God's truth, I really didn't kill that kid. I really didn't kill that kid. John Walsh doesn't buy it. He doesn't think Tool is a mass murderer but believes Tool killed his son. He was a penny ante little chicken. He's only famous for killing Adam. That's all. That's all. 
He didn't kill 50 victims, 100 victims. He wasn't smart. He didn't do this. He didn't avoid police. He was a stumbling, bumbling, low-life drifter who happened to pick the wrong little boy. Truth or lies? Otis Toole admitted he killed 100 people, maybe more, then denied killing one little boy. When we went to God's truth home, I really didn't kill that kid. I really didn't kill that kid. Where did the truth lie? A front page newspaper story had declared Toole and his partner in crime were frauds. So who did Toole kill? How many victims? Even the police couldn't say for sure. Is he the notorious, evil, predatory, cannibalistic, decapitating monster that he's trying to portray himself? I don't believe that. Is, is he capable of doing some things? Sure. So he may not have been one of history's worst serial killers, but he was certainly capable of murder. Toole was sentenced to die for the arson fire that killed an elderly man, but the Florida Supreme Court reversed the decision, citing Toole's questionable mental stability. Toole pled guilty to five murders, guilty to the murder of Geraldine Peoples and two other women in the Bonifay area, guilty in the shooting death of a young woman in Tallahassee, and guilty to killing the sheriff's father. Five lives taken, five consecutive life sentences. I was satisfied that we had the right people with the evidence that we had, the statements that we had, and I was able to put it to rest at, at that. Remember Deborah O'Quinn and the unsolved murder cases in Jacksonville? Toole and Lucas's confessions fell apart. The two were no longer suspects, and the cases were all sent to the cold case file. Deborah's father died never knowing the truth, that his daughter's killer had not been found. This man died believing that Otis Toole was the killer, and we know that he wasn't. We know that now. As for the Adam Walsh case, Toole was a suspect until he recanted in 1984. I told him I killed a kid, but I really didn't kill that kid. Toole said the Hollywood detectives led him to the area where Adam's head was found and he was able to identify it because police had earlier shown him crime scene photos with a bridge clearly visible. I didn't show them where it was at or anything, you know. Mm -hmm. See, I went and found out about the bridge, you know, in the picture and all. Without a confession and physical evidence linking him to the crime, Toole was never charged with Adam's murder. And the case disappeared from the headlines. Then, 15 years later, a lawsuit by local newspapers forced the authorities to unseal the police files. Copied onto microfilm were 10,000 pages detailing the hunt for Adam's killer. Once those newspapers got in those files, they saw one horrible mistake after another. Around the same time that the reporters got into the records, a new team of Hollywood detectives, the Cold Case Squad, took a fresh look at the files. Tucked away in a manila envelope, the detectives found a pair of children's shorts and flip-flop sandals that had been buried in the backyard where Toole and his mother lived. Can you believe that? That after 15 years, they would bring a pair of shorts and a flip-flop that could have been Adam's could have been our sons, could have been buried in the back of his mother's yard. Proved unequivocally, and no one in that police department ever put it together. It turned out that they were not Adam's clothes, but there was other forensic evidence that might have, with modern technology like DNA testing, linked Tool to the murder. Especially the pieces of carpet that police had taken out of Tool's car and there was a blood-soaked piece of carpet in the back of that Cadillac, blood-soaked, that Otis Toole said that he decapitated Adam in the back seat. Where was that blood-soaked piece of carpet? Unfortunately, it was lost. A miscommunication between the crime lab and the Hollywood police led to it being misplaced and possibly destroyed. That was the ultimate piece of evidence in this case. Right, right there, it's lost, it's gone. In fact, the car itself, a potential source of hair and fibers, was also gone. 
it was junked back in, I believe it was um, the early 90s. It was sold and resold and sold again. And it was traced to a junkyard that it's impossible to find it now. What kind of police work is that? In the biggest unsolved murder case of a child in the history of Florida, you lose evidence, unexcusable. Absolutely unexcusable. You lose a car, how do you lose a car? One final mistake. Hollywood's cold case team says it wasn't told that Otis Toole was close to death with cirrhosis of the liver, a lost chance for one last interrogation. You would like to think, as an investigator, standing next to his dead bed, that you, can, you would be able to convince him, knowing he's going to uh, die, to cleanse his soul, that you, you as an investigator could convince him to, to come clean, so to speak. Otis Toole, a man who once confessed to killing hundreds, chose to remain silent. He had pled guilty to killing five innocent souls, but had left the families of other victims in anguish, left to wonder, always questioning. Had Toole killed their loved ones? Whatever the answer, Toole's secrets were buried with him. He died in prison on September 15, 1996. Otis Toole deserved the horrible death that he got. He should have had a worse death, and I hope he burns in hell for the rest of his life. On a summer day, Adam Walsh was taken and brutally murdered. That's all anyone can say for sure. Who killed Adam Walsh remains a mystery. Next, on Cold Case Files, she was murdered. Put the gun to her head and said, you're in trouble now. I knew it didn't look good. But only one clue linked her to the killer. And that's what we've been fighting for for 16 years. The Emmy-nominated series, Cold Case Files, next on a and &E. A man with a goatee, and it was my father. He had been beaten with a tire iron and shot. Sheriff McDaniel's father died hours later. 250 miles east on I-10, the Jacksonville Police Department had its hands full. Eight unsolved murders over three years, including Deborah O'Quinn. This was a case of an 18-year-old young lady that was sexually battered and stabbed to death in her apartment over in the south side of town. Her body wasn't initially recovered. It was recovered almost a year later at a dump site, and she was uh, actually skeletal at the time. So. A lot of your potential physical evidence associated with the body was gone. A trail of crime from one end of Florida to the next, seemingly unrelated, all unsolved, destined for the cold case file. The eight murders in Jacksonville, the women in Bonifay, the sheriff's father. You want to solve every case, especially one that uh, involved one of your family members. Not once in nearly a decade did police suspect they might have a serial killer in their midst. Not once could they have imagined two killers working together, roaming the country. Not much has changed in the sleepy little town of Bonifay. Nestled off Interstate 10 in Florida's Panhandle, this rural country is known more for its slow southern style than for murder. They kill people by various means, for unknown or no reason. It was a long time ago, more than two decades, but there are folks here that still remember the moment when an ill wind blew through town. I remember that, that she was killed at home, and later on they said that uh, probably a man got off the train and went out there and done it. Gerilyn Peoples, just 18, was coming home from the grocery store. And they heard her drive up. Inside, her killers waited. The girl couldn't defend herself. She was two hands full of groceries, walked in, and they were caught in the house. Commenced to there were shoppers all around, even a security guard. It was the middle of the day, yet no one really saw much of anything. Unfortunately, none of them panned out, and we really don't think we have a good, solid witness that saw what happened to Adam. The sun went down, the store closed, and Adam was nowhere to be found. 
Reve put signs all over the car. Adam, we're still looking for you. Adam, please stay here. Anything. And, uh, you know, when nightfall came, it was unbearable because now it wasn't light out anymore. And um, that's when the harsh reality comes in that your uh, things are, are not going the right way. It's unbearable. A massive search was launched. Helicopters looked from above, while friends of the Walshes, even strangers, walked through fields, combed the area, hoping for a sign or a clue. But none came. We'd appreciate anyone with any information about him or have seen him or think they saw him to please call the Hollywood police. Where was Adam? It would be countryside from coast to coast. The idea was beyond belief. But in my experience, dealing with serials, working them, interviewing them, they tend to stay in a certain methodology with slight changes because it's a learning process along the way. They get a little bit better at it. They get a little more comfortable with it. This is different. This is bizarre. Could we have another possibility? They killed at random. No evidence, no motive. In Oklahoma, a woman was stabbed 42 times. A woman strangled, then raped in Louisiana. A little girl abducted at gunpoint in Illinois. But the most explosive and most publicized case centered around the kidnapping, torture, and beheading of a wide-eyed, freckle-faced little boy named Adam Walsh. I always say if you could have ordered a son out of a catalog, that would be the little boy you would order. And I loved him more than anything in the world. John Walsh and his wife, Reve, have replayed that day over and over. One moment, Adam is playing video games at a Sears store. The next minute, he's gone, vanished. Shooter. They didn't want to get caught. A month later, Brenda Burton, a wife and mother, was found stabbed to death in her bathroom. The next month, a few miles away in Chipley, Ruby McCary was shot through her screen door. Three murders in three months. It was as if a wave of evil washed over this town, then, just as quickly, went away. Just down the road on Interstate 10, newly elected Sheriff John McDaniel got a call from his officers to respond to a robbery in progress. We had an armed robbery. We think we've got one trapped in the building. We may have one down. We're not sure what we've got. The robbery was at a gas station just outside of Mariana. It was early in the morning, December 15th, 1980. I arrive at the scene, and I get out, and as I'm starting to approach the little store, one of the officers comes toward me, and, and the look on his face was just unbelievable. And he said, we've got one down. So I kept moving forward, and as I did, I began to see the opening of the door, and I saw a man's feet, and then I saw some trousers, and then I saw 